Hello everyone and welcome to VidGain Systems webinar, What is New in Apache Ignite 2.7? I am Nicole Van Gelua and will be today's moderator. Before starting, I will need to conduct a little housekeeping. Can you raise your hands in, with the hand icon on the left of your screen if you can hear me? I see one show of hands. Can everybody else hear me as well? Two? Right, I see some people still coming in and I see some hands, so I will assume that you can hear me. So we are good to go. On behalf of today's webinar presenters, thanks for joining us. I'd like to introduce our speaker for today. Akmal Chandri, the technology evangelist at GridGain, is focused on Apache Ignite and the Apache community. If at any point during the webinar you have a question, please tap in the Q&A panel. Questions will be addressed at the end of the webinar. Please also note that your phones will be muted throughout the presentation. You've joined us today to hear about what is new in Apache Ignite 2.7. At the end of the webinar, we'll close out by taking your questions. With that, I'd like to now turn things over to our product expert, Akmal Chandri. Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, Nicole, and uh, thank you for all of you that uh, have been able to join um, it's uh, just gone 10 a.m. in the morning here in London. Uh, hopefully, if you're in the UK or in sort of European time, it's still going to be morning time for you. But uh, perhaps we have um, attendees from uh, you know other parts of the world as well. So you know, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Thank you very much for joining. And so let's uh, get started. Okay, so we'll just uh, blow this up a little bit here. There we go. All right, so uh, as Nicole mentioned, so this is um, a discussion of uh, uh, Ignite version 2.7, which was uh, released uh, quite recently. Uh, now, it says, what's new in Ignite 2.7? Now, obviously, there's actually quite a lot of uh, new features and new capabilities. So we're going to focus on, on a few of them, which are perhaps uh, the most significant contributions uh, this time around. And indeed, if we look at the agenda here, on this slide. So we'll talk a little bit about deep learning and the integration of uh, TensorFlow, which I think uh, if you are particularly working uh, with um, uh, this technology already, then uh, using it with Ignite has some additional benefits. Uh, the ability to store uh, large quantities of data, failover recovery, we'll, we'll get onto that. Um, also, multi-language support. So thin clients is uh, a new sort of capability that's been added. So historically, Ignite has been very strong um, with support for three principal languages, C++, .NET, and Java. And developing these kind of big clients, if you like, thick clients, as they're referred to, is quite hard. It's quite a challenge, both from an engineering perspective. And therefore, a decision was made to add additional languages, but using a new approach, which uh, makes these clients somewhat more lightweight, um, but nevertheless extremely usable. And therefore, we'll, we'll get onto that and show you a little bit uh, about some of that. Uh, data encryption, obviously very important in, in today's world, and particularly in any type of system that you're using, and distributed systems are no exception that we need to ensure that you know if we are dealing particularly with very sensitive data, the data are encrypted, and so this is a, a new capability. Uh, historically, if you're looking at um, cluster computing and Ignite in particular, then moving data across the cluster, uh, there has always been an encryption capability there anyway. But now this ability to uh, store uh, encrypted data, if you like, if you're using Ignite as, say, a distributed database system with persistence, then that is a, a particularly useful feature as well. And, and lastly, of course, uh, uh, transactional SQL. So SQL support has been around for a little while. Um, SQL 99 support was added not so long ago. Uh, but the importance here is that, again, historically, if we look at the uh, Ignite sort of key value store, that was always transactional. Uh, but it's taken a little bit of time to add the transaction support to, to SQL, which again, if you decide you want to use this particular interface, uh, then it becomes important, to, again, to ensure the consistency of data that you're moving 
from one consistent state to another consistent state. I think particularly if you're working with persistence as well, uh, you're, you're using Ignite perhaps as a system of record, uh, working with SQL uh, as, uh, uh, as your interface, then uh, again, that becomes very, very important. Uh, okay, so let's just uh, move on then and uh, have a look at this. So if you have uh, attended any of these webinars before, or perhaps uh, some of the meetups that we do around the world, then you'll know that often we use this uh, high level big picture, if you like, that uh, shows many of the uh, capabilities of Ignite. And let me just see if I can get a pencil here and let's have a look at the color. Uh, let's make this black. I think that would be useful. So at its heart, uh, hopefully you can see that without too much difficulty, is this in-memory data store. And let's just see if we can do anything else. No, that's fine. I was just trying to see if I, I could make this a little bit thicker. Uh, that's fine. So um, historically then, it, Ignite comes from that class of technology is often referred to as in-memory data grid. And uh, traditionally then uh, support for key value, which I mentioned just a few moments ago here on the top left. And um, over time then um, additional capabilities have been added. So the SQL in particular, so it's already, ha already had some level of SQL support for quite a long time, but uh, really the, the SQL 99 uh, there was a decision to go in this direction, partly because if you look at the world today, uh, despite the growth of other technologies, NoSQL in particular, uh, the fact is that the vast majority of uh, systems deployed out there um, and what people use to query data is still SQL. And so whether you like SQL or you don't like it, uh, it you know, it's, it's intergalactic data speak. It plugs in readily with a lot of business intelligence tools. Uh, we can build dashboards, and it's declarative. You know, you tell the system what you want, it goes away and figures out the best way to retrieve that data for you. Uh, and it's a well understood technology, been around for a very long time. And uh, again, uh, there is, uh, you know, cost based optimizers uh, can do a, a really good job in terms of retrieving data. So this is uh, kind of Im important there. Um, transactions, messaging, streaming, and uh, uh, events, we won't cover those today. Uh, machine and deep learning we'll focus on in just uh, a few moments. So again, if we look at what's been added as far as machine learning is concerned, um, a, a decision was taken uh, a little while back to add this capability, uh, and they built these algorithms from the ground up. Uh, they work in a distributed environment, and a little bit later on when I'll show you uh, some of the uh, uh, demos and things, we'll, we'll have a look at uh, the specific sort of machine learning uh, as well, just very briefly. Uh, but the thing is, the, the, this works whether you use one node or you run a cluster, uh, but the real power obviously comes if you are using a cluster. Um, and that was quite a, a significant engineering effort. Now, the thing is that with deep learning, there are plenty of good toolkits, frameworks out there in the real world. And one of them happens to be TensorFlow, and it is extremely popular today. And therefore, again, you know, sometimes it is far better to make use of what is already available out there rather than reinvent the wheel. And so again, a decision was taken that it, TensorFlow integration is going to be far more useful specifically for deep learning capabilities. And therefore, um, whilst Ignite's machine learning library was added and built from the ground up, the, the TensorFlow integration is, I think, a far better approach if you plan to do any deep learning. Um, in terms of the persistence layer, then uh, we'll look at, very briefly at Ignite persistence a little bit later on. Uh, but another nice feature of Ignite is the ability to work with existing data sources. And this is, again, historically in terms of what is an in-memory data grid. You know, it's a data fabric. It sits between your, what your storage is and your applications, and it gives you those two benefits of scale, um, it's cluster computing, you know, scale up and down as you need resources, and again, performance, okay, because again, if we if we utilize it purely sort of in memory, then we get the benefits of uh, in memory speeds. Uh, however, uh, it's, Ignite has added this kind of durable 
um, memory, the ability to save state and data, and uh, particularly for the encryption example, which we'll look at a little bit later on, uh, that's going to be very relevant. Now, if we look on the, uh, the left and the right-hand sides, let me just try and draw here, we can see these kind of gray boxes uh, or sort of light blue if, if uh, you've got that particular um, sort of screen color. So this is coming up as a little bit sort of grayish to me uh, on my monitor here. Uh, so what we have in the middle, all of these capabilities are available with the open source. Uh, version, but what we have on the left and right side, these are some enterprise features that are available. So monitoring and management, for example, additional security and auditing, uh, data center replication, rolling upgrades. And I think particularly if you're working in some larger sort of enterprise environments, then you want something beyond just what the open source uh, offers you, then this is the way to go, okay? Grid Game provides these uh, features and capabilities and uh, you would come and discuss these with, uh, with us and uh, we'll, we'll be happy to talk through and uh, you know, give you uh, further information about these and uh, work with you to identify what, what, what would be relevant for your uh, particular use cases. Okay, let's just move on a little bit. Um, one of the things that you'll see often mentioned in a lot of the literature that uh, GridGain has recently put out, some of the white papers and things, is this reference to this, um, what's called as a continuous learning framework, okay, CLF. Uh, you'll see that mentioned uh, quite often. And so the thinking is really that in the real world today, uh, if we look on the left-hand side, this kind of before picture, so we've got uh, user, application and we are storing and processing some data perhaps in a relational database system uh, maybe we need to do some type of etl uh, perhaps we have a data lake or a very large kind of data warehouse so from time to time you know some of that data is going across and we're storing that and we're doing subsequent uh, processing of that maybe using things like machine learning or deep learning um, and so this kind of process it is very cyclical here, as you can see, and it also involves lots and lots of different steps. Um, it can be quite cumbersome if you're doing things like ETL, for example, and in particular if you're dealing with large quantities of data, taking that data out from one system, importing it into another system, and then you know if you want to do additional type of processing, uh, then it becomes cumbersome and, and, and difficult and time-consuming. And then you know we live in a world today where decision making is very important we, you know you're thinking about sort of minutes uh, rather than sort of days and weeks that you might have had to, uh, the luxury to do in the past uh, it, it's just simply not feasible you know it's a very competitive world risks and opportunities come up all the time and therefore you need access to information far more quickly and so the idea if we look on the right hand side then is this kind of approach that we see with this uh, continuous learning fr framework okay storing and processing working set uh, from the application directly into your in-memory computing platform uh, the ability to do the machine learning uh, directly again inside the platform itself rather than having to use etl so it supports it uh, directly and again Things like integration with TensorFlow has great benefits here as well, okay? No need to export data out and, and use it in TensorFlow. If the integration is already there, you just use the same platform. So no ETL, that's uh, very important. Instant updates of models, again, uh, particularly if you're working with things like machine learning and deep learning, I think this is a very important consideration. And again, think about some scenarios, for example, uh, transactions, uh, banking, um, fraud detection, very, very relevant today. So we all have mobile phones. We all do sort of mobile banking. So a lot of these requirements are, are driven by user needs, the, the, the need to process data much faster. You know, millions of transactions are arriving into your system. You could build some kind of machine learning classifier uh, that can work on the, those transactions as they arrive. We can very quickly identify fraudulent transactions or potentially fraudulent transactions and then process them accordingly. Um, and again, over time, uh, that classifier, it, it can become better, okay? Because uh, it, it's being trained on new data as the new data arrive, okay? And as we are able to um, improve the quality of that, then that, that makes it, you know, it, it good from all perspectives. It's great for the, um, uh, for the customer because 
the ability to identify fraudulent transactions and then not misclassify them that's a great benefit you don't constantly get contacted by your bank for example and then similarly from the perspective of the bank or the financial institution it's great because less of their time is wasted uh, chasing up and, and investigating cases where uh, it, it may be unnecessary okay and so again we see that yes it's the same kind of cyclical thing uh, again here a continuous learning framework so it's feeding in and looping around and improving the quality of the data, improving our knowledge, uh, utilizing the tools that are directly supported. Very useful. Um, specifically, and if we look at the components of this, then we've touched upon a couple of these already. So we talked about the persistent store, okay? So now Ignite provides its capability to store data beyond the lifetime of the process that created it. That's, again, a very useful feature and again let me just get my pen here yeah that's fine here we go okay all right um can, still can use it as an in-memory data store if you wish uh now as far as the uh, machine learning is concerned we touched upon this just very recently i talked about the fact that you know this distributed core algebra so this is very useful you know this library has been built from the ground up to take advantage of distributed processing um, so you're not just running everything on one node for example uh, and that's very very powerful again the ability to divide and conquer utilize the resources of your of your cluster both in terms of processing and storage again that's very valuable and as far as the kind of algorithms are supported, k-means, regression, decision trees, so on. Uh, I'll show you a, a couple of these very briefly a little bit later on. And of course, TensorFlow, which we've touched upon as well. Um, and again, if we look at the top here, then I, I briefly touched on the fact that, you know, we've got da, Java, .NET, uh, and C++. These are the kind of, uh, if you like, thick clients, okay? And then we'll, we'll see the, what, what, what is the difference between these and the thin clients momentarily as we get onto that section. Um, but here, this binary protocol, um, there are versions um, of these interfaces, Java, .NET, and C++ for the thin client as well. But new thin clients have been added. So Node.js, for example, and I'll show you an example of that very shortly, uh, PHP and Python. Uh, Python, I think, particularly if you happen to be doing a lot of work in uh, machine learning, very popular language for data scientists, and, and that could be very, very useful for you. OK, so TensorFlow integration. Well, TensorFlow works in a distributed fashion already. You know, it's, a, it's great for distributed uh, training, which is what it does really well. Um, and it can do this at scale. Um, the nice thing about the integration with Ignite is, is that what we can do now is that any TensorFlow nodes and Ignite nodes uh, can be kind of co-located, if you like. They are deployed together. Uh, this means that there's less d data movement, which again is something we, we want to try and avoid in a distributed system. So with local data, uh, that data can be processed uh, in, in machine, okay? Because the, the nodes are co-located, it, it, it means that if there is some data movement, it, it's done within the machine itself rather than across the cluster, okay? That has significant benefits. Now there is uh, early, sort of integration um, with TensorFlow at the moment, but there is a roadmap, okay? And uh, I'll give you a hyperlink to this a little bit later on to show you what's planned down the road. And again, there's a, an article from one of my colleagues uh, at GridGain, Anton, and again, I'll show you the reference to that, that provides much more sort of architectural information in terms of the, uh, the how the integration actually works, plus some examples as well. Uh, and if you're interested in, then, you know, have a read of that, uh, that will be very useful to give you a nice overview of how this actually works in practice. Um, okay, distribution of user tasks written in Python. We touched upon this uh, a few moments ago. So, you know, Python support already available through the thin client, but again, great if you're working with uh, these um, kind of notebooks. Uh, Python is a, it's a fabulous language, uh, you know, because it's interpreted, you can change things uh, very quickly, test things again, uh, and very, very useful in, uh, for data scientists. Automatic creation and maintenance of TensorFlow cluster, minimization of ETL costs. We touched upon this a little bit earlier on in terms of ETL, very useful. Again, co-location, uh, just in-memory data movement. And the thing is that what does Ignite bring to the party then? Well, the thing is that because it's cluster computing, 
uh, essentially once TensorFlow is up and running, uh, Ignite kind of just steps back. However, if there are problems, uh, say something goes down, you know, we lose a node, then Ignite steps in, you know, provides the fault tolerance. Uh, and also there are some additional capabilities that we have in terms of when we are running some uh, large job, for example, say it may take an hour and let's say sort of half an hour into uh, some processing, uh, we lose some parts of our cluster then this partition based sort of data sets this uh, capability is very very useful again because it enables ignite to provide the fault tolerance capability it means we don't have to restart our job uh, from the beginning again it, you know we can continue processing from the point that uh, something failed or we can do some recovery immediately that, that's again very useful so i think in the past particularly uh, at scale sometimes you know jobs can take a long time uh, I think that's less of a problem these days, particularly, you know, technology has advanced, uh, GPUs, uh, CPUs, T, you know, TensorFlow, TFUs, I think as, they, as they're called, uh, all of these things mean there's this kind of dedicated hardware that can be used to speed up these tasks, which is far more useful. But still, sometimes processing can take a little bit of time. Okay? It, it may require, as I said before, you know, you may be running something that could take an hour, but uh, cluster computing being what it is, and often it's uh, off the shelf type of hardware, sometimes failures occur. And, and actually often they do occur. And therefore you need some capability to recover from these type of failure situations, uh, avoid wasted time. And Ignite does that uh, you know, in buckets. It it's very handsomely takes care of those issues for you. And therefore it's far less for you to worry about uh, in, in terms of uh, uh, fault tolerance. Okay. Uh, let's move on then. Um, now, what I'll do, okay, so I'll save a couple of things for the end then to show you a little bit later on, but uh, we'll talk about the multi-language support now. Thin clients. Uh, so the way these work is it at the socket level, okay? It's a binary protocol, as they say. Um, and this approach has a number of advantages because it means that it, it's uh, more lightweight, uh, can be implemented much faster, okay, because there's a specification for this, and therefore, uh, it, you know, additional language support can be developed much, much uh, faster. Uh, and again, that's helpful because I think sometimes people want to use a lot of these modern languages, that, such as Go, for example, or if you are working in in the it, it, as a data scientist, Python, um, uh, and developing much larger so-called thick lines takes time. You know, it's quite an engineering challenge. So thin client is an API above the protocol and language specific implementation. And again, I'll show you a little bit of Node.js running in a, in a, in a moment. Um, Java.NET C++, so we talked about this a couple of slides ago. So these have been historically supported anyway. And there's good inter interoperability between these languages as well. I've written some content about this, some articles about this, showing how, for example, we could take uh, Java objects, uh, store these in an Ignite cluster, and then subsequently we could read them using .NET, for example, and vice versa. So we could create objects in .NET and read them back in Java. So that's very useful. But they've also developed thin clients for, for these particular languages and added support for Node.js, Python, and PHP. All right, so here is a, a kind of a nice uh, summary, if you like, e comparing this uh, so-called e thick client, the regular client uh, versus the thin client, okay? So if we look at the level of cluster communication, the problem with a thick client is that regardless of what you're using, whether it's Java or C++ or .NET, it, all, it always fires up a Java virtual machine process to handle that, and, and, and that can uh, you know, consume resources. Um, what you are running uh, in terms of the client then becomes a part of the cluster topology uh, and it opens up a number of ports, okay, which some of them may be unnecessary. And if we compare, compare this with the thin client, then it, it connects through a proxy. So the client will connect to a node <clears throat> and then use that node as a proxy to be able to undertake its work. So it do, the client itself doesn't do anything. It, it simply opens the connection up to a, a node on your cluster and then uses that cluster, uh, that node to do the work for it. It's TCP IP, okay, and only one port needs to be open, uh, opened, much more useful. Uh, scale and performance, 
Uh, thick client best goes to primary roads directly. Okay, so uh, the, your your node, whatever you're running, then as part of a thick client that joins the cluster, it can become part of the processing. Uh, uh, you know, in terms of you doing additional processing, that can be useful in some cases. Okay, so it, it you have to weigh up the the, the pros and cons of this. Um, thin client really it won't help you in this uh, sort of scenario because the the client itself doesn't become part of the cluster. You cannot use it to do any type of additional processing. Um, and again, because it communicates to a proxy, again that adds you know some additional sort of uh, uh, overhead there. Um, all Ignite and GridGain APIs supported in the thick client. So essentially, if you need to utilize a lot of the APIs, uh, then the best option is to stick with the, with the thin client. In the thin client, at the moment, it's limited to some get put operations. You'll see that momentarily with the uh, Node.js example that I'll show you. Um, there is SQL support as well and some configuration. So it's uh, a subset of what uh, the uh, the client can do. However, um, changes, uh, features, additional capabilities are in the pipeline, they are being planned. Uh, and one of the things to bear in mind again, which is I think not shown on here, but in the uh, thick client, then if you want to do things like transactions, for example, if you're working with key value, for example, then that is that capability is built in. You can do that directly. Whereas in the thin client, um, transactions are not currently supported. And again, you'll see that in the example I'll show you momentarily. Uh, supported languages, we talked about this already. So the three major languages that uh, historically Ignite has supported really well, Java, .NET, C++. Um, and it says they're time consuming to support other languages. So it's quite a challenge, you know, building these uh, uh, thick clients. It, it, it requires a lot of time and resources to do this. And therefore, I think, uh, particularly because of the need of modern environments, you know, to move quickly, the support for new languages should be much faster uh, than going down this route of using this kind of binary protocol and then building these thin clients uh, enables the new languages to, to be supported much, much faster. Okay, now, uh, before we get on to the transparent data encryption, let me just uh, exit from here momentarily, okay, then and just show you a little bit of an example. Or, all right, now, uh, I hope you can see that without too much difficulty. Let me just try and zoom in a little bit, okay, and then we'll show you what I've actually got running here. I set this up a little bit earlier on just to save time. So in this particular window here, what I've done is I've just launched uh, one Ignite server node. And as you can see here, it says servers equals one, no clients connected to it. So we have, um, if you like, that represents my cluster, okay, on, on my local machine. It's enough for demo purposes and just to show what we're trying to, uh, um, to demonstrate here, which is fine. Um, okay, now, just below here, uh, I've got this thing uh, called a web agent, okay? So this is um, kind of an interface. It's using a REST-based interface, uh, which is this agent is talking to uh, my cluster and actually if you uh, let me zoom in a little bit more okay, a little bit sharp eyed you can see here that it's actually found the uh, particular server node that i happen to be running in the window above and that allows me then to access this cluster uh, using this ignite web console uh, as we say here okay so this is on the good game website console.gridgame.com you can create a free account just play around with this test it out um, one word of recommendation though if you are interested in this technology uh, download it and build it from sources host it behind your corporate firewall and run it from there uh, running it on Good Games website is fine just for playing around testing purposes and just to get a feel for what's available but obviously not recommended if you if you plan to do and you know use it for say sensitive data or, or you've got your own particular system that you want to, to test out here it's fine um, it's found the fact that there is a, a one cluster uh, node which is fine and uh, if we just uh, skip over here uh, we should be able to see that it's got some statistics here. So this has been running for a, a little bit of time. So it'll have, I think these uh, graphs will update. Yeah, it takes a moment or two. So CPU, heap size, and so on. Uh, nothing particularly interesting here. Not really very much going on, uh, which is fine. Uh, and then if we just uh, go back, 
and have a look here. So as part of the uh, Ignite uh, distribution version 2.7, there is uh, some code. There are some code examples uh, which cover uh, Python, PHP, Node.js, and so what I've done here, I've got Node installed on my uh, local machine here, and uh, I've got the uh, uh, Thin Client uh, uh, installed as well. And within this window here, we can actually see. Let me just zoom in. You can see that there's a, a number of examples that come here. Uh, I, I've got a few other things in here which I've, I've written, and I'll point you to the article where these uh, actually come from. But one of the simple examples that comes as part of the distribution is this cache put get example, uh, which we can run directly from here. And you can see it's pretty fast. So this is just sort of key value. OK, and all it's doing, it's uh, creating a number of entries if a, if a cache doesn't exist, it will create one, and then it will just uh, load it up with uh, uh, a number of uh, these sort of person entries. So here we've got an ID of one, two, three, and four, uh, John Doe, Jane Rowe, Mary Major, Richard Miles. And uh, we can actually have a look at the, uh, okay, just quickly show you the code. Okay, now obviously we don't have time to go into the details of this, but this is the kind of standard layout, certainly for the Node.js uh, thin client. Uh, some definitions that we need to include uh, at the top, including the uh, uh, Apache Ignite uh, client there. Um, the endpoint, which just happens to be localhost uh, port 10800. Uh, there is a particular cache here that uh, it, if it doesn't exist, it will create it. And then we've got this sort of person type, which we've de defined here, okay, class person. And if we scroll down a little bit more, just have a look here. So it, it actually goes into a little bit more detail here to say what it's actually going to do. Uh, but you can see the code implementation here. Uh, you know, it's, it's a, a good example of what's possible and the different ways that we can uh, uh, access the data. We can do a sort of, I think there's a scan query as well, which returns everything. There we go. And at the end, it just exits. Now, the thing is, I, I changed this code slightly because if you run this uh, piece of code, what happens is that it creates the cache and then at the end, it destroys it. So all I've done is I've just commented this line out here, which normally destroys the cache, so that I can have a look at this uh, using the, uh, the console. So we saw just a few moments ago that it created uh, four entries here. And then again, if we go over and have a look here and scroll down and have a look at the um, Ignite uh, storage, uh, we can see here that it's created this uh, Ignite storage for us, cache put get example underscore person, which we saw in the code just a few moments ago. And then here we can see that it's created four primary entries. Uh, and this is off heap, uh, uh, off heap entries, OK? Total of four. No backups in this particular case, but you know that's configurable and changeable. Uh, in this case, we've, we've only got one node running, so it doesn't make sense to uh, create a backup. But if we've got additional <coughs> excuse me, uh, nodes in our cluster, then we could do that. OK, so let's just uh, minimize this. All right, now what I'll do is I will shut this down because in order to show the next uh, demo, it, because this is running from my command line and I want to show something from the uh, IDE, it may interfere, okay? And that we'll, we'll uh, make sure that uh, the demo will work properly, okay? So let's uh, head back to our slide deck and then move on to uh, transparent data encryption, okay? Okay, so, um, the world we live in today, you know, even if we look at modern computers, uh, laptops, uh, if you have, uh, say, a Windows uh, laptop or Apple Mac, uh, then, you know, the vendors provide uh, encryption support uh, for the data. You can, you know, whole disk encryption is available and uh, password protected or uh, through some key 
very, very useful. And therefore, you know, extending this to the enterprise uh, level, obviously, if you are going to be working with sensitive and personal data, um, then it makes sense to provide it, it, sort of encryption at that level as well. Uh, the way this can work is that if we are working in with Ignite, say, using its persistent store capabilities, then that's a great way that, you know, to ensure that the data are protected, okay, that it's not just readable um, because Ignite uses this notion of sort of partition files, okay, where each node holds some part of the overall uh, database and also because now things get a little bit more complicated if you've worked with database management systems you know that logs are very important uh, in, in when fail failover happens uh, or, or cluster failure happens you know recovery is very important and logs give us that ability to replay uh, or restore uh, our system to some known state and therefore there are things like write ahead logs as well so ignite does not use in place updates but it uses this notion of write ahead logs so we ch write the uh, updates to the log at some time these changes are flushed you know dirty pages are written out uh, and subsequently the, the size of the log is reduced uh, and the system is back to uh, uh, a, 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 you know a sort of consistent fully working uh, state um, with, with the log reduced to a minimum so that's important, okay? We, we need to ensure that whatever is stored on disk gets encrypted uh, and isn't readable. So it makes sense, okay, so to handle these uh, partition files and write ahead logs. Um, Ignite uses this notion of caches. Uh, you'll see this mentioned very often in the literature. Uh, think of it just like a storage though, okay? And that's probably a better way to, uh, uh, to express it. So, when we want to encrypt at the level of a cache, if we are just dealing with things in memory, for example, or if we want to write uh, things to disk, then if we are working at the level, say, of key value, which we did in that Node.js example, we created a cache, uh, we could create encryption keys just for the cache itself. Um, now, obviously, Ignite also supports SQL, okay, and therefore we can extend this capability to things like uh, tables as well. These encryption um, uh, keys can be stored in the system cache, okay? This is something that's not accessible uh, by a user. It, it, you know, it's not sort of a, think of it like metadata, okay? It's, it, it's protected, it, it needs particular privileges to access it, and therefore it, it's uh, totally protected from uh, any type of user uh, access. Um, there is this notion of a master key as well, so used for persistence and transferring of cache keys okay so we have the ability to define this uh, master key so if we are storing things then um you know there is a uh, often um you know with encryption technologies we can create a, a like a super super key or a master key that allows to protect everything that we have and we can do this uh, with ignite as well um, one of the nice features of ignite is that it's a very pluggable um uh, system uh, the, lots of the api specifications are freely available and uh, easy to use uh, and so if you want to extend the system somehow uh, you know there's some additional features or capabilities that you want to add uh, the, the specifications are there they're very easy, easy for you to do that uh, at the moment the way that this uh, master key is stored is through uh, the jdk store and again i'll show you an example momentarily however there's nothing to to prevent you using some third party system if you like uh, or writing something yourself if you if you wish to do so it might be a little bit of an effort but i'm, I'm sure that uh, if you are skilled in this area then it, it's certainly possible um now the reason that, that they haven't provided additional sort because people they you know the community doesn't know what you want to do your requirements may be very different from uh, uh, another person's requirements and so the, the jdk store is available out of the box that's the kind of minimum if you like that's uh, shipped with the product you utilize anything further beyond that that you find useful and that you may uh, want to uh, uh, make use of okay so th there's something that comes uh, readily available if it doesn't meet your needs then you know by all means uh, look at other solutions uh, and because of the pluggable uh, architecture that ignite has it, it's certainly possible to use uh, other encryption uh, uh, technologies as well all right let me just exit here a moment then and let's have a look at this okay so 
I, I think I may just terminate this thing here as well. Let's have a look. Okay, that's fine. All right, so uh, over here, uh, I'll, I'll expand this out for you in just a moment, okay? But just uh, take a moment here. So uh, this particular um, project that I've got within the uh, IDE, this is the binary distribution of Ignite version 2.7. And all I've done is I've downloaded it, unpacked it, and then there is a, a pom.xml file which is in the uh, for the examples. And I've just read that in, created this project. And as you can see here on the left hand side are all the code examples. Uh, let me just blow this up a little bit for you and just have a look here. Okay, so some of those things that we talked about a little bit earlier on, <coughs> excuse me, uh, let, let's have a look. So, machine learning, for example. So a lot of those capabilities that they built from the ground up, everything is described here. Some of the newer things that they've added, uh, let's have a look, uh, the pre-processing, okay, that's been significantly expanded. Uh, let's have a look, uh, logistic regression, that's a new one that's been added, uh, and some other things as well, and also tutorials, okay, so there's quite a, quite a bit of, uh, uh, example code here to show you how to do this. Uh, one of the things that wasn't available in the past last year when I when I was working on this and, look, and writing some articles with this uh, train uh, test split, this capability is now available within Ignite. Previously, I, I, I had to use a scikit-learn to do this and then be able to uh, get the data into Ignite and then do, do the processing that I wanted to do. So that capability is built in there. Um, other things, let me just... Uh, shrink this down a bit so one of the other things then that comes with this okay is there is a, an encryption example encrypted cache example okay and that actually is the code on the right hand side so let me just make this a little bit smaller and then if we can just move across here uh, and have a look at the code so what this is doing then is that uh, let's just try and make this a little bit wider this code is a lit, quite a bit wide there there we go all right, so this is um, creating uh, an encrypted cache for us, and it's saving that state to disk. And you'll see here that it's really done very, very simply, just through one line here. Set encryption enabled to true. Uh, and then what we've got is, is though we are dealing with some bank account information, which uh, here, obviously, we're just using some dummy data here, but Think of, of this if this was real kind of bank account data, and we want to ensure that it, it's not readable once we've saved it, for example, that it is protected, then we can do that. The state is saved to disk, so the cluster, this will start up, um, uh, create this um, bank account data, store it to disk, and then subsequently it will launch and then read it back again, and then give us the, uh, the data back. But Whilst that data are stored on disk, they are encrypted, okay? I mean, that's the key point here. Okay, and let's just shrink this down a little bit here. So I've got a bit of room to uh, to run this, okay? And then we can we just run this directly from here, okay? So let's try this. There we go. <coughs> uh, and one of the nice things is that if you are new to Apache Ignite, uh, then as long as you've got Java, and I, I'm still using, unfortunately, an old version of Java here, uh, but creating this project, having Java installed here, the IDE, all of these examples can be run directly from the IDE. I can create some cluster nodes directly in the IDE. Uh, interestingly, though, as, as I mentioned a little bit earlier on, the machine learning, for example, uh, and I think this goes with some of the other examples as well, you don't need... Um, sort of large amount of resources, you know, everything will work standalone, which is fine, just for testing purposes. But obviously, as I mentioned, the real benefit will come when you scale this up, when you use uh, a number of uh, uh, machines, you know, put together your, your cluster, have some nodes, uh, and uh, then you, you, you'll see the real benefits. Okay, so here, as you can see, we've gone through a couple of steps here. You'll see that, you know, Ignite has launched there. Uh, a little bit of information to, to tell us what's going on. 
Ignite started okay, and then it's told us that it's going, it's created the encrypted cache, it's populated the cache with data, it's written that out to disk, okay, that node has been stopped, and then we've restarted the node again, and what it's done, it's gone to that encrypted cache, it's read the data, and now we're getting the data out uh, and back out to the uh, terminal here. Okay, so take the opportunity to have a look at that in your own time. But as you saw before, very, very easy to set up. Simple sort of uh, configuration that we need, but extremely valuable in today's world where you know we're dealing with many, many sort of requirements within different organizations. We have to protect user data. And, and you hear about these data breaches all the time. Uh, I, I monitor this from uh, time to time on, you know, on the, in the Twitter world. Lots of problems in terms of customer data being leaked all over the world uh, because people have misconfigured and set up systems incorrectly. Uh, you know, if you're using strong encryption, at least that gives you one level of protection, which can be very, very useful uh, as a as a first way to to, to stop uh, these type of uh, problems of uh, data being shared. Okay, so that's fine. This is stopped. Um, not running any cluster there, it's okay. All right then, uh, I'm conscious of time. Okay, so we've got a couple more slides left and then we'll just wrap up there. Okay, there we go. Transactional SQL, this is in beta, all right? But please have a look at this, okay? It could be very, very useful. Now, the thing is that, as I said before, SQL 99 su support has been in uh, Ignite for, for a little while now. The, the problem, and it, again, it's an engineering challenge, you know, the opportunity to ensure that it's fully transactional. So if you're running a series of commands in SQL and you're doing changes, for example, particularly updates, inserts, deletes, you know, modifying the data, um, you know, you want to ensure that your what, what your view of the data is is consistent and that if somebody else is doing exactly the, the sort of similar operations uh, upon that same data, and again, their view is consistent as well. So this has taken a little bit of time to add, but it's in beta, okay, and, and, and it's progressing along quite rapidly, and it uses this notion of MVCC, multi-version concurrency control. Uh, and the way that it works in Ignite is through this notion of transactional snapshot mode, okay? We need to configure this and set this up specifically. Uh, and then once the node knows that this is what, what it's going to be using, we can use this capability. If we look on the right-hand side, um, there is an example. Okay, let me just blow this up uh, a little bit. And we can, oops, sorry. Just have a look. Just scroll to this side. Okay, so here we can see we've defined, let me just see if I can get my, let me get my pen. Yeah, there we go, yes, uh, black, okay. So here you can see we've started at this as the start of the transaction. We're performing an insert operation here, okay? And then we're doing a, another operation here. This happens to be an update. And then at this point, we could do a commit uh, here if we want. Uh, and that will ensure that all of this uh, is processed and either all of it happens or none of it happens, okay? Because now we're dealing with a unit of, uh, you know, sort of atomicity, if you like. We, we've defined the boundaries of what this transaction is supposed to do. In this particular case, I mean, what this example shows is a rollback. So uh, we, we've done these operations, but we've, we've decided that we don't want to commit these, so we we'll just undo them, uh, and that's fine. So... This can become quite complex. You know, if we've got a large amount of uh, code uh, that we're dealing with, a lot of changes that are going into the database system, then this is a great way to ensure that, the, again, the system moves from one consistent state to another consistent state. Because it's beta, there are currently some limitations, okay? And there is a, a link that highlights what those limitations are. And again, I would encourage you to take the time and have a look at that and uh, really brief yourself for, on some of those uh, uh, issues. Okay, so uh, resources then. So uh, Nicole will make this uh, slide deck available uh, just after the webinar. I think it, it'll be posted fairly quickly, but you'll have the opportunity to have a look at this in your own time. So as you can see, it's more information about the TensorFlow integration, 
more about the thin clients. Uh, obviously, data encryption, again, if this is important to you, then take the opportunity to have a look at that as well. And then particularly for the transactional SQL, uh, as I mentioned before, it is in beta, but it, you know, it, it's, it's quite far uh, advanced and uh, uh, certainly usable today. And have a look at that, try it out, test it out. And again, if you have any comments, uh, any feedback, provide that to the uh, Ignite community. I think that would be very, very useful. Um, we've only had the opportunity to touch upon a couple of the things, really the major sort of changes, but there's a, a lot of other things that have come along with this particular release of Ignite, and there is a uh, full sort of uh, release note available for this. Again, the link is provided at the bottom there. Um, okay, so in the interest of time, I'll skip this slide because there's a couple of things I want to show you, but very briefly, so Ignite support is now available from Grid Game as well. Okay, so this is essentially what this is saying. And so this is just a recent announcement within the last couple of days. Uh, and again, uh, we'll, we'll put a link in for that for you to have a look at that. Uh, and then I promised you a couple of things, which I said I would show you very briefly. Now, let me skip over here. So firstly, for the uh, TensorFlow, <coughs> excuse me, Okay, so if you're familiar, so this is the uh, TensorFlow on the uh, medium.com uh, website. And uh, my colleague Anton uh, wrote this piece on uh, TensorFlow on Apache Ignite. So it goes into quite a little bit more detail describing the specific approach. And then some, I think there's some benchmark numbers here as well, and some bits of code. And there is uh, some links to uh, some online. Uh, uh, resources that he's put together, which you can actually try this out for yourself. Okay, so you can just connect to these and, and test them out for for yourself to see how they, how this actually works. That's uh, a, a great way to start. There is additional information on this on GitHub as well. Uh, certainly for the other things, then very briefly. So if you're interested in the Node.js, how to get started with that, I, I wrote a piece on the. Uh, um, which is available on, on both DZone and the uh, Grid Game website, getting started with Node.js, Thin Client, and uh, Apache Ignite. Very simple, this one. It just shows you how to set things up, what's the installation process, how to run the examples, and again, how to set up the web console, which I just showed you uh, a few moments ago. Um, a slightly more useful uh, example, I, I would say, and a bit more meaty, if, if I can put it that way, is this one which is uh, using a couple of technologies. So we often refer to this idea of no rip and replace. So Ignite works really well with a lot of existing uh, technologies, database technologies. And the idea is that you don't have to replace them. Okay? They have business value. And therefore, something like Ignite can be really useful. It can supplement. It can complement what you already have. And so in this particular article, what I've done, it's quite a long one, okay? because there's lots of screenshots. Uh, I've taken. Uh, some schema and information within a MySQL database, uh, created Ignite storage, and then using Node.js. I, I didn't have to use Node.js. Actually, it could be any of the interfaces, but it just so happens that I picked that because I thought this would make a nice follow-on article to the installation article. And we go through the steps to, to show how we can access the, the data, do some modifications, do some joins, for example, and some updates as well. And then how those changes are propagated back to the uh, MySQL system if we are doing some uh, uh, updates. So that's kind of a, a, a useful uh, thing to look at. Uh, and also, let me just go back a little bit further. And here we go. So uh, Anton, my colleague Anton, did a piece on uh, TensorFlow. His article is more recent, but I, I wrote a piece a, a little bit uh, um, earlier this uh, earlier this year in January, which uh, it just takes a high level kind of overview of uh, some of the capabilities we've talked about, the the benefits of the integration between uh, Ignite and TensorFlow. And then there's a couple of gross sort of graphics here which show how the distributed training works. And then in the event of failure, what kind of tends to happen. Uh, there is some documentation. And as I mentioned before, there is a, a GitHub, uh, which is part of the official TensorFlow integration. So we have, uh, there is some, uh, Anton has been contributing here. And again, you can see lots of information there, which I think some of that formed the basis of his article, which was published on that Medium uh, website. 
Okay, and with that, I, again, I'm conscious of time. Okay, so we have about five minutes or so uh, left. So I, I think there would be a good place to stop. And uh, if there are any questions, happy to take those and I'll do my very best to answer them. Anything I don't know, I will follow up on. And uh, so in terms of email, just uh, first name dot last name at gridgain.com. So it's just akmal dot chowdhury at gridgain.com. Uh, okay, Nicole, back uh, back to you then, please. And uh, if there's so any much, questions, Akmal. happy to take those. We'd like to give you the opportunity to ask, ask your question to Akmal. So type your questions in the Q&A panel now. I'll take a look and see if we have any questions already. So um, we uh, there is one question which we received, and the question is this, Akmal. Yeah. How do you split up data from training to testing data? Okay, so within the tool itself, uh, we've got here, if I switch back to this and we go to the machine learning. So as part of this um, uh, package, uh, there is a tutorial. Uh, I think I, I mentioned this a little bit earlier on. So we have here, just double click on this. So there is actually some code example that shows how to do this directly uh, within Ignite. So previously, uh, when this uh, machine learning capability was in beta, we we didn't have the opportunity uh, or, or the, the or the capability to do the train test split was not available in Ignite. So you had to use a third party tool. Which when I wrote some of my articles, kind of middle of last year, I had to do that. I used Scikit-Learn to do that train test split. But once I had the data, uh, I wanted I loaded into Ignite, and then I can run. Uh, my uh, sort of algorithms there, that's fine. Now that capability has been built in and there is a specific sort of tutorial here which shows a walk through the steps to show you how you can do this directly in the product. So now you don't need a third party product anymore. It's directly supported by Ignite, which is much, much better. Again, it, it follows on from, from that whole kind of vision that I was trying to get across right at the beginning of the presentation that essentially what we want to do is to have things integrated far more uh, within the product so that you don't have to do ETL, you don't have to use other third-party tools to achieve uh, uh, this kind of capability. So I, I would encourage uh, you to have a look at this uh, train test split example. And again, this will give you a, you know, a great basis to understand how this actually works within Ignite. Thank you, Akmal. We have no further questions today. So I would like to thank our speaker today and thank each of you for joining us and your participation. Thank you. Have a wonderful day. Yeah. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you.